Dr. Elfrida Freddy Ebert is president and CEO of Tex Project, a nonprofit which provides resources to support higher reading levels. She is also a research associate at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Dr. Ebert has worked in the field of early reading acquisition for 45 years, first as a teacher's aide and teacher of primary level students, and subsequently as a teacher educator and a researcher at the university level. Her research addresses how fluency, vocabulary, and knowledge can be fostered through appropriate texts. Professor Ebert's research has been published in numerous scholarly journals and has authored or edited nine books. Dr. Ebert has written extensively about issues of text complexity and its interpretation and implementation in Common Core classrooms. We at the Office of English Language Learners feel lucky to have worked with Freddie since 2007. She has been a keynote speaker at several of our conferences, in addition to presenting at our Leadership Institute. And after today, we can add webinars to our list of collaborations. So without further ado, let me introduce to you Dr. Freddie Ebert. Thank you so much, Stella, and thank you so much for this opportunity to develop some ideas in another context, one that can be archived and people can review. I'd like to give you an overview of these two webinars that we're going to be doing on text complexity and vocabulary. Today I'm going to be laying the base on the role of vocabulary in complex text, and then I'm going to be talking about things that you can begin doing in your classrooms. One of them has to do with the uniqueness of informational narrative text, and the other one has to do with monitoring how much your students are reading. In our subsequent webinar, I'm going to talk about some general and specific lessons. So I'm going to be talking about some very specific kinds of things that we can do to expand the vocabularies of our students for complex reading. So today, my three goals are to lay a foundation, talk about the difference between vocabulary and informational and narrative text, and then to talk about the role of extensive reading. No one I hope that you've had the chance to take a look at this article that we described in the registration venue. It gives you some background, and perhaps after this webinar, it will be even more valuable to review some of the ideas. The element of the Common Core that's different than any previous standards document we've had, and which is also causing lots of confusion and misinterpretation, has to do with text complexity, Standard 10. Unlike the past, where grade levels were cited, but they were never defined clearly in terms of specific kinds of level text, the Common Core makes grade levels explicit. There are other aspects of the standards that are unique, like distributions of narrative and informational text. But for English language learners and students of poverty, for students for English learners and students of poverty, the text complexity standard is likely the most critical. After all, if you're struggling with current text and suddenly you're expected to read even harder text, your school experience is going to be challenging. Now, with regard to defining what complex texts are, the Common Core writers provided exemplars of the text that they considered to be complex within the standards. Although we need to understand that the process whereby they got these exemplars is left unexplained. In addition to the exemplars, the standards writers suggested that there were three means of establishing text complexities. Teachers have long made adaptions for readers and tasks, part of the text complexity model that the writers allocated to teachers. But the qualitative basis had virtually no precedent, validation, or models for district or state application. Nor, I really want to underscore, we haven't had a lot more guidance on how this qualitative assessment might take. We've been given a couple of rubrics. But precisely how it looks at different grade levels, we haven't learned any more about that in the last three, three years since the standards were introduced. In fact, the standards writers have put their energies into validating additional quantitative 
systems. And that indicates to you just how firmly rooted the quantitative systems are to the model of text complexity. Now, the quantitative measures were spelled out very specifically. So what I've been suggesting here is that the qualitative and the teacher, the reader task, the, the evaluation teachers are to do, remain really vague. But we have a very, very explicit set of guidelines for quantitative measures. On this chart, the red circle shows the discrepancy. So there's the red circle, shows the discrepancy between the text of 12th grade and those of college and a variety of workplace and community texts, including those of the military. That difference, and that represented by that red circle, is real between the level of high school and college. Now this orange line shows the difficulty of text that the developers of Lexiles, they're the ones who wrote this report, found in their analyses of school books in the Lexile database in 2010. You can actually see that after a fairly robust start, the line starts to flatten in middle school and it extends into high school. Now that orange line is based on data from analyses of school books. The yellow line, and that's the staircase of text complexity, is hypothetical. The Lexile team hypothesized that to get students to college and career reading levels by high school graduation, the acceleration needed to begin in grades two and three. I want to underscore that there's absolutely no research, none, that validates that trajectory depicted by the yellow line. There's no evidence that if we get students to read formally in kindergarten or that they're reading at particular levels, you know, like at a 980 Lexile as fifth graders, that they'll attain college and career readiness. So what I'm saying is that all of this pushing up is hypothetical at this point. The only real evidence that we have is that there's a gap at high school and that there's been a leveling off of text complexity starting in the middle grades. Now, the effect of this staircase recommendation has been monumentous. I'm going to show you three sets of text. There are about 50 words in each of them, and that's the amount allowable under copyright laws. These examples are intended for middle schoolers. I selected middle school as my focus today because that's where the decline in text complexity begins. And also because this is the level where high school dropouts, high school dropouts make their decision that they're going to drop out in middle school. They just don't have the autonomy to drop out at that point. Now, I can't say that for all of them, but that's what the research indicates, that those decisions are made in middle school. And most of them are made because of students' views that they just can't do the tasks. Middle school texts are critical to understand for these reasons, but I want to emphasize that the patterns that I'm showing you also apply to elementary and high school. Now, the two texts that I'm showing you here are ones that formerly would have been taught in grades 6 to 8, but now in the staircase of text complexity have been relegated to grades 4 to 5. I've highlighted words, those are the words in purple, that are rare in written English. And I'm going to describe how I do this later on and how you can too. I just want you to keep an eye as I go through these examples of the purple words, the concepts that they represent, and also the number of syllables involved. Because multisyllabic words are the ones that typically are problems for struggling readers. And often EL kids have some struggles with reading. Now, here are texts given as exemplars by the Common Core writers as appropriate for middle school students, which formerly might have been read by ninth or 10th graders. Do you see how many more purple words there are? In the right-hand side, there are, what, about six? And on the left-hand side, about seven. And that means in 50 words, that's how many purple words there are. And those words keep coming at the same rate. Now, I do want to point out that while they've recommended these two books, I doubt that, that many kids were reading these books in ninth and 10th grade in the past because as full-length text, the one on the left is A Night to Remember and the one on the right is Geeks, 
they're really not only very dense in terms of vocabulary, but the ideas are ones that probably don't merit, aren't worthy of time in the school day. But I'm going to suggest that there is some good news. The assessments rec recommended by your state and also the assessment consortium PARC, of which you're part, have vocabulary levels that aren't as onerous as those of the typical common core exemplars. Now, I'm not saying the texts are dumbed down. They're still challenging, but they deal with content that's more accessible to students. I also want to underscore, and I'm going to be bringing this up throughout these webinars, that the texts of the assessments aren't full-length books. Most are magazine articles. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm saying a curriculum should only be magazine articles, but in my analysis of the sample passages, I do see that there are a lot of magazine articles, and as I'm going to show you today, they can have some unique features, and I think it only fair to our students and to ourselves in the profession that we become acquainted with what this is and ensure that our students have the background for it. But the point I'm making here is that when I look at the exemplars of PARC and also the New York State Assessment, I'm saying that these are more realistic and more appropriate than those of the exemplars in the Common Core. Now for some challenging news. So I've been saying that the Lexiles are really driving our notion of what's complex they rely more on syntax than they do on vocabulary. In fact, they don't give us any idea, a lexile, so a number like 980 or 1020, they don't give us any idea of what vocabulary is associated with the level. In the past, readability formulas like the Dale Chaw or the Flesh Kincaid that's on a lot of computers um, well, actually, the Flesh Kincaid used, uses syllables, but the Dale Chaw used specific groups of words to determine where to put text along a scale. So you actually knew what words were associated with what grade levels. In digital formulas like Le Lexiles and ATOS, the, the uh, system used for accelerated reader, the vocabulary measure is, this, is a statistic that's the average of all the rankings of the words in a text. Now, this way of figuring out the vocabulary means that a text like Henry and Mudge, where, where there's an unusual name, Mudge, which is repeated 30 times, has the same vocabulary index as Black Ship, a set of Greek myths aimed at middle, middle schoolers. Okay, and you can actually see here that if the word gets counted as a hard word every time, we don't have any hard words at this point in black ship, but what we're seeing is that just because it's a 460 lexile doesn't mean that the vocabulary doesn't have a lot of rare words. And just because it's 1050 doesn't mean that there might not be some a lot of accessible words. What I'm saying is that the syntax, you see here that there's 10 word difference between the sentence lengths the average sentence lengths in these programs, in these two texts. So the first point I've been making has to do with the critical role of vocabulary. I'm going to suggest to you that when we're looking at increasing capacity, and that's something we can all stand behind, the Common Core says we need to increase the capacity of students over the grades to read increasingly more challenging material. That's a really great goal. My question has to do with quantitative measures being used to primarily uh, determine what that is, or rather um, undefined selections of text as the parameter or as the baseline for what kids are supposed to read. But if we're looking at raising kids' capacity, very good goal. What I'm suggesting is that vocabulary is really the lowest hanging fruit. It's the thing that's most amenable to instruction and for ELs that's something that they really need a lot of. Now yes, syntax does influence ELs performances, but syntax in reading is very 
difficult to influence directly through instruction. It can be influenced through writing, and we also know that doing a lot of reading helps develop syntax awareness. But what I'm suggesting at this point is that quantitative indices, sometimes my computer can have a life of its own, quantitative readability systems don't necessarily, they don't in fact, give us an understanding of vocabulary. And that's something as teachers at this point in time we need to develop strategies for, which is what we're doing in these webinars. So the first point is, and I've developed these mantras for you, so we're going to have three conclusions and I have this short little statement for each. Provide accessible text and teach words. And by accessible, I mean text where students can read at least 90% of the words. And I'm not suggesting dumbed down text. This is an example of a text, um, the little snippet that I've given you here that's been used in middle school in the state in which I live, California. And quite honestly, a text like that, which is intended to reinforce phonics skills at a point where lots of VLs are actually very proficient with decoding, but it's meaning and content that they're struggling with. I'm saying texts like this are really, really inappropriate but text that kids can read as long as we're continuing to increase capacity are the kinds of text that they need. And I'm also saying we need to have an intentional vocabulary cur cur curriculum. And by that I mean as teachers we need to know what makes words hard and we also need to know what underlying patterns are that generalize across words. And that's what we're talking about here. So let's move to the complex vocabularies of informational narrative text. What needs to be taught in terms of vocabulary? This slide shows the distribution of English words in text. So the distribution of words in any language is very lopsided. A very few words account for a lot of the words in text. And what we have in English is that we have about 4,000 word families and you see the kinds of words that are there. Some of them are the academic words. In fact, about if you've heard a lot about the academic words like um, um, result and observe, according, consist, is an example of an academic word, relate, compare. Those words, about 80% of them, are included in this core vocabulary. So the core vocabulary, and you can find the, um, the list of the core vocabulary words for your your use. This isn't something for kids to memorize. But these words, um, and I've given you the URL there, these words account for 90% of the words in all of the exemplars of the Common Core through college. These words are prominent in the text you read. Okay, So that set of words is a really fundamental thing for kids to get good at. We could talk about those words to a greater degree, and maybe at some point we'll do a session on that. But what I want to really point out is that for complex text, we also have to have some strategies for the other 10% of the words, words that I'm going to call complex vocabulary. Okay? And in that group, in the purple group, there are about 300,000 words. Now, as you've seen from some of the words that I've shown, some of them are single syllable words that presumably kids can use phonics strategies on. But the point about these words is that they don't occur a lot in text. Among these 300,000 words, all of them occur less than once per 100,000 words. And for a lot of your students, 100,000 words is a lot of reading. Lots of them haven't covered that much ground, even by the time they're in fourth or fifth grade. 60% of these words actually occur only once per every 10 million words. So they might be words that can be easy to figure out, but they're words that are unusual or don't have, the kids haven't seen them in text before. But when they occur, they're very important. They give quality to a piece of literature, words like ominous and precarious. And in informational text, they're words like photosynthesis and propulsion. Yes. ELs need a strong foundation with that core vocabulary, but if they're to be successful with complex text, we need to start teaching them patterns and connections. 
in this complex vocabulary. And I want to reassure you that there are patterns among these words. You don't have to think that we can only teach them in this massive group of 300,000. First of all, that's not possible. And language has a basis. Words don't hang out by themselves. They are parts of different kinds of groups. So what this set of Venn diagrams is showing you is that both the narrative literary text and the content area text, they share that core vocabulary. Sometimes that vocabulary is used in little different ways in the content area text. A word like wind or force or energy might be used very differently in a story than it is in a content area text. But there are a shared group of words, but it's that other 10% that's really different. And it's those kinds of distinctions that we want to attend to. And the basic idea here is that the other words in content area text are in conceptual categories. And the literary words are in semantic clusters or categories. Let me show you what that means. Here's a narrative text, again, about 50 words. And what you see are lots of rare words, OK, about four. Uh, per 50, which is about 8 per 100, which is for third grade, which is what this level is. That's pretty high. So when authors write stories, they draw liberally from the 300,000 words. They need just the right word. So what this captain did here is he radioed. He didn't call. It was important to know that he was actually using a radio because at this point that was the only way a ham radio to get into this community. So if a character is trembling, a narrative author might use a number of different words, such as shake or quiver. But in content area text, writers use particular words very precisely. Now, I'm not suggesting that narrative writers aren't precise in a certain way. They're painting a picture. They're developing nuances. But in content area text, there are specific words that are used, and these words are repeated quite frequently. And there isn't a synonym for these words. So in other words, rather than using vibrations, a science writer wouldn't use shake or quiver or tremble. This word has a specific kind of meaning here. What's really great is that content area specialists have defined what these words and content areas are. So if you look down below at the science words, we see words like bedrock, inherited characteristic, water capacity. Writers of text use these, when you pick up a science text on a particular topic, like in earth science, you're going to expect to see some of a word like bedrock. Okay, You're not going to expect to probably see the word um, ominous or even a word like quiver. But look at the words that are uh, in, in orange. When you examine the words for English language arts, you don't see some of these extra, these, these complex words that appear in stories like tremble or precarious. The words that are provided here have to do with the talk about language. Yes, it's important to know about abbreviations and capitalizations and paragraphs and so on. But these aren't the words that you're actually going to find in the text. What I'm saying is that our standards writers, including those of the Common Core, haven't given us guidance in what the kinds of words are that we need to be looking for in vocabulary. They're very, very well defined in content areas. For example, I don't know any novel where abbreviation or capitalization is the protagonist or the hero of the story. But we know that in geography, we are going to learn about the rainforest. We are going to learn about vegetation regions. So this is one big difference between the complex words of content area and narrative text. Content area specialists have identified words, and there's a lot of clarity as to what the words are in content areas. As teachers, we don't have to grapple and run around trying to identify what critical words are. That's not the case with English language arts at this point in time. Hopefully, th some things will be different. There's another difference of 
how words and content area vocabulary function. And that is, they have connections, conceptual connections to each other. They aren't synonyms. So this unit on chemistry illustrates some of the key vocabulary that scientists have identified and the secondary words related to those concepts. So they told us in, in designing a science program that dissolved substance and property were really important when we were talking about designing mixtures. As these words are learned, the meanings of the words in relation to each other, so property in relation to substance, substance in relation to dissolve, those the meanings become richer. For example, as students do experiments with abrasive and acidic substances, they come to understand properties. And they also come to understand substances. And this vocabulary takes considerable experience. You know, you don't just learn these words by somebody telling them to you. That's why we have inquiry, discussion, writing. There's a lot of critical activity that we do in the content areas. There's another way in which the vocabulary of content areas differs from that of narratives. The vocabulary is cyclical from grade to grade. We continue to cycle through the book content, but with each iteration, we expand on the vocabulary. But we keep building on the vocabulary that we've already had. So when we go to fourth grade, we keep the words that we've had in second grade. And when we go to sixth grade, we keep the words that we've had in second and fourth grade. So in fact, as happened in many primary classrooms during No Child Left Behind, we forgot to do science or social studies. We have kids who miss some basic concepts and don't have the whole foundation of understanding needed as they go into the higher grade levels. You can see here that yes, science vocabulary is very dense especially if you haven't gotten some of the precursors in the years before. So vocabulary is clearly defined in content areas and we know what to teach. It's really a matter of ensuring that we give the time to it and also have the right activities for developing those activities for that knowledge. The situation is a very different one when we're teaching stories or narrative, which is why I'm emphasizing this vocabulary in these webinars. We spend a lot of time on literature, especially in elementary grades, and a lot of our vocabulary is around literature. A lot of the most complex vocabulary, of course, is that of, of science and social studies, but this vocabulary functions very differently in stories. The words on the left-hand side of the slide show the words that were used in a set of stories in a core reading program. Unlike the ideas in the content area text which were introduced in school, kids actually have an understanding of these concepts. They might not know the word fascinated, but they have the concept of attending to something. They might not know baffled, but they know about being mixed up or not understanding something. They simply don't know these words. So what I'm suggesting is in narrative literary text, the whole conglomeration of the text might be something that's very hard to make inferences about. But I'm saying in relation to rare vocabulary, kids typically have those concepts. What they don't have are the specific words. The second point is that the author could have used other words. Rather than being fascinated, the character could have been enchanted or rather than being baffled, the character could have been perplexed. These words have slightly nuanced meanings and presumably the author used the particular words for a reason. But what I'm saying here is let's not just attend to baffled when baffled shows up, but also learn some of the other options that the author could have used. Let's talk about why the author drew on that particular word and not some of the others that the author could have used. And this idea that there are large groups from which authors can draw needs to be brought out in lessons time and time again. You might not know that precise word, but students need to know that they understand the concepts. 
And what they need to keep doing is add lots of meaning-related words to the words that they already know. And it's especially in writing that this application occurs. A particular reason I'm emphasizing these words is that people who write magazine articles for kids, for children and adolescents, use lots of verbs and adjectives that are more commonly associated with narrative text. Why is it important to bring this up? Well, I've already hinted at the fact that magazine articles are really the basis of current assessments. Magazine articles, I also think, can be very engaging for students, but they need to have an understanding that sometimes, like in a passage on ecology, you really wouldn't expect this word erasing, or in earth science, the word nestled or even the word slot in chemistry. That's a very colloquial kind of word to be using there. So students need to develop a stance and expectation, not just in stories but also in magazine articles. They need to be prepared for an abundance of these words and they need to know that the authors are drawing them from words that they actually understand the concepts, they just don't know these particular words. Now, you don't have to worry that there are thousands and thousands of these words to teach. There are patterns that underline these uh, complex words in narrative text. Most of the words that are really important in narrative and literary text are words that have to do with communication, the emotions of characters, and their movement. Authors use these words to tell you a lot about what's happening in the story. And these 15 words actually represent the most prolific groups of synonyms. And further, except for perhaps observe and maybe argue, although students have those concepts, I think that these are words that EL students probably have learned fairly early on in oral language. As I said, these are basic ideas and stories. We're having a lot of discussion now about close reading and so on. Close reading really applies to the author's choice of words. They can give you important clues about the text. You know, that's all the author has to give you ideas are some of these words. And they change, they use very actually precise words to communicate these ideas, not in the same word, way that there's precision in science and social studies words, but they have chosen these words very carefully. They're nuanced. So for example, if the character plotted rather than thought out, is, he, the character isn't thinking of a plan, he's plotting a plan, you're getting some information about the character's motives. If a character quits rather than departs, that too is valuable information. Now, I've developed this map for one of these 15 words. I don't have all of them yet. That's a project for the future, and if any of you want to share maps that you and your students do, I am happily add them to our website. But what we do have at Text Project to, do, to support this idea of the massive amounts of, of distinctions we have in our language through vocabulary, you know, the difference between eavesdrop and listen and wiretap or overhear, those are some very distinctive meanings. And so what we've done at Text Project is we've developed 32 lessons. And because we're a not-for-profit, not those, those are all for free. But we've identified common words. Some of those 15 really prolific words are here. And we've developed lessons so that teachers in any subject area can use them to expand their own vocabulary and to have students start understanding how we could use these other words and phrases and idioms in different kinds of contents. So we've also got as part of this, um, these lessons frames for students to, to put in some of the words that they're gathering. We've also got morphological families that can be included and again forms for that. We've also got activities that give you some background and some things that you can talk to 
talk about with kids? What are some questions that you could could use? What what might be how is listening different than hearing something? Um, and so on. Okay, so my second point. So the first one, we were talking about the necessity of teaching vocabulary and the fact that our current indices don't give us a good indication. What we found out here is that there are some patterns to the complex vocabulary. They're different for genre. And complex vocabulary needs to be conceptually connected and in, liter in literary, that should be literary vocabulary, not literacy vocabulary, they should be semantically connected. Okay, so teach word clusters. Whenever you're teaching a word, be getting kids to think about the group of words that surround it. My final point has to do with vocabulary learning and the amount of reading. This is going to sound very commonsensical, but the thing is, if we want kids to read complex text, Anything that's complex requires you to put in some time to learn it. And the thing about reading, about text, text is actually where concepts are extended and developed. So you can see here, somebody's done an analysis of the rare words per thousand in popular magazines, children's books, in adult shows on television and also in conversations between college graduates. And the reason I'm emphasizing magazines in this context is as you can see, people, journalists, use lots of, of rare vocabulary. A lot of times they give names, even if all the names aren't necessary. They give the name of the street in Manhattan where something happened, um, which is very interesting for folks in New York, but sometimes kids here in California kind of look askance at that. My point is that vocabularies of texts are much more richer. Even books like um, Goodnight Moon, which is represented in the children's book category here, than the conversations we typically have. So vocabulary is really critical as a foundation of books, but it turns out that the amount that we're reading in, in let me just clarify a point I'm making here. What I'm saying is just by volume of reading, you're going to encounter a lot more words in reading than you are in conversations. And those words are going to be critical concepts. I mean, you could talk with people a long time and never come up with a word like propulsion or volcano. And it's through books where we get a lot of our concepts. So it's volume of reading really matters. And we can't be asking ELs to be reading text where they don't understand a high percentage of the words. Even 15% not, not understanding is a very high percentage. Makes it meaningless and incredibly challenging and very, very discouraging. But we want kids to be doing a lot of reading because that's where information sits. And even when we have kids reading on, you know, people will say to me, well, why do they need to read? We've got YouTube and so on. To be able to negotiate the web intelligently, you need to be able to read. 21st century is the time of the people who know. It's not the haves and the have-nots. It's the knows and the know-nots. Okay. Another critical thing that, that we found is that in reading first classrooms, the amount of time in these classrooms we were looking at, and we looked at many classrooms, we actually found that reading instruction increased 100%, but the time that kids spent reading increased about 15%, and a lot of that reading was around scattered kinds of, of um, pieces of text. There was nothing, that there, you know, they might read a little paragraph here and a paragraph there on entirely different topics. There wasn't the opportunity for a lot of um, sustained kinds of reading where they needed to then report back or discuss or describe something that they learned. I love this study uh, that um, Melanie Kuhn and Paula Schwogenflugel did. It was part of a ramp up of a fluency intervention. And actually, these researchers found that 
the interventions didn't, the intervention and the baseline classrooms weren't different, probably because by that time everybody knew that fluency was important. But they did find that there was a difference between the seven classrooms where the kids were most successful and those that weren't the seven where they were least successful. I don't know why they keep coming up with sevens in the study, but the point is they found that it was actually distinguished across those classrooms by about seven minutes. And I figured out that if you're reading at an average rate of third graders, that's where the study was done, um, you know, seventh graders are going to be reading a little faster. Um, some of the kids who are struggling might not be, but even if you were reading at that rate, you'd read about 160,000 additional words. And given that data that I showed you over here, that means that you'd have acquired about 5,000 new rare words in your reading. That's a critical aspect, and I'm saying that we can't expect our kids to be reading complex text when they simply don't read a lot. And we can't expect them to be reading after school when they haven't developed a success and a successful reading habit in school. Most of us don't do what we're not good at in our day jobs at night at home. We need to develop some baselines in classroom where kids are doing a lot of reading and being successful at it. So my last point is increase classroom reading and develop stamina. I really haven't talked about that. Stamina means, and well, it was what I was referring to when these kids were kind of flitting around from different texts when they were reading in the, um, in the No Child Left Behind classrooms. Kids need to read for sustained periods of time. The first state to apply the Common Core Standards Assessment is the state of Kentucky. Um, I can share some of those results with you next time. So they were the first state that started on the Common Core. And what is being reported back there is one of the things that the kids weren't ready for is that the assessments required them to do some sustained reading. So they needed to you know, read by themselves for periods of time. And some of these kids were used to, to doing that maybe for five minutes, not for 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, in conclusion, provide accessible text, teach vocabulary, and when you teach it, I'm saying clusters, which are adapted for genre. And the amount the kids are reading is never talked about in the Common Core. And I know this is very commonsensical. Maybe we need a common sense standard too. <laughs> But what I'm suggesting here is that if kids don't read a lot, they never get very good at it. Some of you have heard me say that um, Alice, who's the manager of this webinar today, um, works with me. And I've actually asked her, I've outsourced my exercise program to her. And what we're finding is that Alice is getting much more fit with Pilates and I'm not. Now that's supposed to be kind of a joke. But my point here is, is that if we want kids to be reading complex text, they actually have to be reading in the classroom. Now, uh, for our next webinar, I hope that you'll give a shot at doing one of these, um, or do your own kind of semantic map, but I've given you some models for these in the exceptional expressions. And I would also like for you to take a look at how much your kids are actually reading in your class, if, if it's um, standalone classes, or if you have students at more extended periods of time across the day, or even have students take a log uh, one day to find out what it is that they're reading. How much are they reading? What are they learning from their reading? I think it's really important for us to get a baseline to look at how much are we actually reading. And I'm not meaning just counting up words like we do in Accelerated Reader. That's not the point. What is it that I'm learning from my reading? How much am I actually doing this thing reading and what am I getting from it? Um, I want to point out that we have a lot of resources. The Exceptional Expressions is there on the website. Um, there are lots of other things available for free download as a not-for-profit. We provide those. And um, Stella, would you like me just to jump into some of these questions? Uh, yeah, oh, actually, yeah. that would be great if you can, okay. Freddie. Thank, Thank you. Okay. So um, we generated some questions from some of the things that um, we've been asked about this. And the first one is, um, as you can read it, what happens for students who have mastered the core vocabulary and yet struggle when reading text independently? And I'm going to come back to my last point here 
um, I think we just have to really look at the fact that often we've given kids who haven't learned prior to coming to school. Our curriculum in, in the United States works really well if you already learned everything before you came to school. If you haven't learned to read and you're pushed into very hard text and the text of K1, 2, and 3 are difficult, and the Common Core of the statement is made that those texts have been dumbed down over the past 50 years. That, in fact, is an erroneous statement. Texts have been dumbed down after fourth grade, not K1, 2, and 3. In fact, how could you have dumbed down K text when we didn't even have them till the decade of No Child Left Behind, like 2003? So the texts have been difficult. We've had a lot of rare vocabulary in first and second and third grade texts. For example, in many of the level texts, there are lots of unique words. And kids who haven't read a lot actually acquire a core vocabulary remarkably well. But unless they do a lot of reading, they just aren't facile and fluent with it. And the core vocabulary, we could have lots of discussions about that, but our core vocabulary in English is the vocabulary we use for idioms. And there needs to be a lot of experience with it. And that's also where oral language comes in. So there needs to be a lot of discussion and also reading for kids to have the foundation that they need with that core vocabulary. Um, a second question was, what about the clustering of vocabulary words? It needs to be intentional. So, so how do you cluster? Well, I talked about that there's a clustering method with content area vocabulary. There's also a cluster method. Remember, these are very different bases. Here we're looking at clusters of shared concepts, but the words don't mean the same. And these words have very precise meanings in content areas. In narrative literary text, we have a lot of words. Kids have the basic notions, but they might not have some of the refined meanings, and they might not realize that some of these words can take on very different meanings. This, in fact, is an example of a word in the core vocabulary that takes on lots of idioms and is in lots of common phrases, which is, again, something for English language learners to really develop expertise on. So I've been suggesting two kinds of concept clusters, but there are others, too. I know that New York City um, Office of English Language Learners, you've spent a lot of time with Noni Lucille, and she's talked with you a lot about morphological families. That's another way of clustering. And as you saw with my exceptional expressions, we actually were doing some of that clustering of morphological families as well. Another kind of clustering that we spend much less time on uh, in American reading instruction, but yet is a very prominent aspect of English words. Remember, our language has words that come from French, and those are words like, you know, argue, argument, argumentative, and then we have words that come from Anglo-Saxon or German. And in German, what people do is they make new words by compounding existing words, and they're often, you know, pretty small words. So the thing about compound words, that's another form of cluster. And it's a hard kind of cluster to teach because these words are typically idiomatic. Okay, all the words that have over on them don't have exactly the same application. Sometimes they can be very idiosyncratic. A really good example of that is playground and playgirl. They both have the word play in it, but they mean some kind of very, very different things. Or a cowboy. Um, isn't exactly a cow. Um, so um, I'm always told that my, my grandfather, when he immigrated to Canada, was looking, uh, went looking in town for a chicken boy, which he meant was, you know, he was looking for a rooster. And he thought it was a chicken, but then he added the word boy to it. He, he, he was a German speaker, and he was actually compounding in the way you would in German. So um, I'm suggesting that there's some other ways to cluster. Um, how do we decide which vocabulary words in narrative text give us the most gains or use? And I was offering you some of these words. These are things you all need to understand that the field of vocabulary, um, of English vocabulary, is jumping ahead by leaps and bounds. 
if you think that you know three or four years ago we didn't have things like Google Books, where now you can take a look at massive databases of what 300 million more than that words, and you can get a sense of how words are used. That research is hardly being felt in what we're doing in schools. This graph that or this uh, chart that I have up here is an example of some of the new things that people are learning. And what we're learning is that some of these words are used often in stories, that they're very prolific semantic clusters of words. I just, I'd say like start with these five in each of these areas and start getting kids to look for how authors use movement words and start collecting some of those movement words. That's again an example of clustering. I hope in about <clears throat> by summer that we actually have a, a set of lessons. If some of you, like I said, wanted to add some of yours to uh, uh, give them, share some of yours with us, I'd like to have these available just like we have the exceptional expressions. I think these are really important notions of going through and, and showing how the author shows you that this character is selfish or that this character is afraid or what kinds of ways a character's observations lead to the solution in the story and so on. But each of these words is part of a very prolific family. And that was just an example that I was showing you. So I think, um, Stella, that I've um, answered most of the questions. Um, how much should kids be reading at each grade level? That's a question I don't know an answer to. But I would say a lot more than 18 minutes a day. Um, people like Dick Allington give exorbitant numbers for how much kids should be reading. But I think you need to have read at least a million words by the time you finish fourth grade, and most of our kids haven't. Why do I say a million? Because you'll have covered the core vocabulary many, many times, and you'll, you should be pretty good at it. But right now, all I'm aiming for is people increasing their reading by that seven minutes a day that we found in that research. I mean, that's about what? An increase of about 35, 40 percent. And I think that that could make an enormous difference. Kids don't have to read, you know, 10 hours a day, but reading at least a half hour, um, a little bit more in um, upper middle school and high school, I think can go a long way. So I think um, those are the things that I really wanted to say, talking about the vocabulary clusters and also the need for us to remember, we need to keep our common sense as we go into this process and we also need to take a long view. And teaching words is something that can help ELs enormously, teaching vocabulary in a systematic way and giving them op opportunities to read. So I was jumping ahead there, Stella, to the comments that you're going to make. So. Okay. Um, so the archived version of this event will be available online. When it is posted, we will send you a confirmation email message. We hope that you will attend the next webinar with Dr. Ebert on February 26th, and remember that registration will begin two weeks before. We want to thank you, Freddie, for your time and for sharing your expertise. And thanks to all of our participants who I'm sure are leaving the webinar with new and inspired thoughts on how to help our English language learners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Freddie.